Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, CISSP CRAM session. My name is Carol Auth of SANS. Today's featured speaker is Eric Conrad, certified SANS instructor. He will be moderating today's webcast. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenter, please enter them into the questions window at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to turn the webcast over to Eric. Hey everyone, welcome to the webcast. So this idea we had for a while of kind of boiling down the essence of CISSP into a really rapid uh, fire webcast. Had the idea for a while and now we're doing it. So 45 slides in 45 minutes and I'm, I packed as much testable content as I possibly could. Now at the rate I'm gonna move, uh, if you've see, seen my webcast before, I tend to give them at about one slide per minute <laughs> because you can always hit pause. Uh, you know, the recording will be available as Carol said, uh, you can play it you know, as many times as you want, slow it down. I already uploaded my slides to ericconrad.com. Um, they'll also be available, um, as Carol said, on the SANS portal later on today, but you can download the slides right now. Just go to ericconrad.com. And um, I'd rather say more than less. And sometimes I get the comment of, you know, Eric, I couldn't write things down as fast as you were going. And my answer is, well, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, we have 45 minutes to an hour together. Why not maximize the content, right? And uh, you can reach out to me there. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take questions at the end, but if you have a question, you feel free to email me at econred at gmail.com. My email address is right there. So I'll hold questions till the end just so I can kind of motor along and kind of get in the groove here. But feel free to e email me. There's more bandwidth available. Uh, I'll have maybe 10 minutes for questions, but via email, I have an unlimited amount of time for questions. So hit me up there, follow me on Twitter, Eric Conrad, and uh, let's do it. So I'm gonna cover the content on the exam with two slide exception of the exam itself, only because the exam itself is an odd, odd beast. We're gonna have a later on a longer webcast where these two slides will be expanded into a full webcast of the mindset of taking the exam. Again, this webcast is primarily on stuff on the exam, right? But I did wanna have two slides on this adaptive thing they did. And the mind uh, trick on the adaptive exam is the better you do, the harder it gets. The better you do, the worse you feel you're doing, right? The engine seems to be geared towards making sure you get every other question wrong, half the questions wrong. So if, if you're crushing it, you're doing really well, it's gonna get brutally hard. Um, but you wanna crush it, obviously, right? So it's a, it's a very, and I, I get constant emails from students because I teach, you know, I've taught thousands of students how to do this. And the most common email I get post exam was, I felt like I was drowning. I felt like I was being strangled to death. And then I, I passed, I couldn't believe I passed. I've even had students who passed the exam tell me they felt underprepared. And I'm like, you passed the exam. Yeah, well, I, you know, the exam ended in a hundred questions that I felt underprepared. I'm like, and you passed, right? You passed. <laughs> so I'm just trying to set that expectation. If you walk out of there thinking you just got beat up in an alley uh, and you passed, well, you passed, right? And um, oh, on top of that, so the better you, if the exam ends at a hundred questions, you either aced it or did the opposite of acing it, right? If you go past 100, you're somewhere in the middle, right? The exam ends at 100, you either pass, you get to a point where you, you, you're you guaranteed to pass or you're guaranteed to fail. If you go past 100, you're somewhere in the middle, right? And by the way, 25 questions don't count. 20, up to 25 questions are potential future exam questions. They're not marked in any way. You can't tell whether they're exam questions or not, whether they, they count or not. So if you see 100 questions and 25 don't count, and the, and the engine's geared towards for the other 75, making sure you get half of those wrong, you're gonna feel like you're failing the exam. You will, and just be ready for that. And it's, you wanna do really well. Uh, we'll talk about that now on this next slide here. Um, well, here it is here. You wanna focus heavily on the first few questions, the first five or 10 questions. The better you do on those five or 10, the better you do on the exam. And remember, if you ace the first five or 10, the exam's gonna shift into brutal mode. And just get ready for that, right? Um, but if you ace the first five or 10, the odds of passing the whole exam are uh, much higher for you. This is worlds away from the, the paper pencil days and Scantron sheet this exam came from, right? So it's computer uh, testing, adaptive, and psychologically can be difficult. But again, the most common piece of feedback I get is I was sure I failed and I passed, uh, often in 100 questions, meaning you aced it, right? All right. 
So the probably the most important thing for the exam is to think like a CI SSP. Um, the, the role you have on the exam, you're like a middle-aged information security manager for a large mid-sized firm. You are conservative. You don't like taking chances, right? You have a non-tactical background, by the way. You're not like, uh, you know, I've been ISSO, I've been HIPAA security officer, but I am a natural born engineer. My first real job was Unix sysadmin, right? And so I come from the engineering side. That's the wrong mindset, by the way. And I have been ISSO and I have been HIPAA security officer. That's the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. But I, I'm a natural born engineer and I think like an engineer. And I'm sure in my exam, I got questions wrong because I was given the engineering answer and not the management answer. Give the management answer. And safety is number one. That's going to be the easiest questions you see. You know, the building's on fire. What do you do? You get out. You get out of the building. <laughs> you assist others getting out of the building if necessary. And there's a whole fire ward and fire safety section that I won't have time to get into in my 45 minutes with you because I spend, uh, in class, I spend 46 hours with people. I'll give you an idea. They're, they're pretty sick of me by the end of the week. It's, it's the longest boot camp in SANS. Actually, no, 51 hours. I shaved it. 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. most days, right? <laughs> so I can't cover everything, obviously. But um, the, the, the question might say, the building's on fire. Do you retrieve the backup tapes from the safe? No, you get out. <laughs> you just get out. Safety, safety, safety. Safety is always number one. Ethics are critical. These are the canons that you must agree to. These, this is what you sign on the dotted line to become a CISSP. It's not just passing the exam. It's passing the exam. It's getting endorsed by another IC squared credential holder, and it's agreeing to this code of ethics. This code of ethics is testable. Right? They can ask you, and then the full code of ethics, which I won't have time to get into, is testable. You should memorize this. You should know these in order, okay? Those four in order. When I took my exam, I thought I had to agree to that. I didn't realize it was testable. That was a mistake, right? So you should know those, and you apply those in order, by the way. Uh, if there's ever any disagreement on those canons, if three you know, it, you know, uh, disagrees with one or something like that, usually one disagrees with two. Um, it, it's unlikely to happen in your lifetime. But there have been times during, say, um, genocides when breaking the law was the ethical thing to do, when, um, you know, one overrode two. Now, I've had students get worried they may have to do that in their professional career. That's unlikely. But clearly protecting people from genocide was the right thing to do, even if it was illegal. That's, that's why they're applied in order. Now, that's a pretty extreme example, but it's a real example, right? So if there's ever any disagreement on the canons, you go in order from one, two, three, four, okay? and uh, protect the organization, and there is money behind it, but money never overrides one, two, or three, okay? You never let money override, you know, uh, we have sample questions in class, and one of the questions is, you know, what's most important? The confidentiality of your PII, you know, a, a web server's down. What's the most important thing? Protect the confidentiality of your personally identifiable information or getting the thing back online to make more money. I've, been, I've literally had students say, no, no, it's okay to lose PII. We need to make the money. I'm like, that is such the wrong answer on the exam. You couldn't have a more wrong answer on the exam. The protection of PII is always more important than money, all right? If that's not true in your day job, I'm sorry to hear that, but on the exam, it's real, real simple. So in your parsing questions, you're wondering what's the right answer because it's often very fuzzy. The exam likes to deal in best, you know, best answer, worst answer, and none of us really think that way. No InfoSec professional who's any good thinks best, worst. It's all shades of gray. It's all trade-offs, right? We're always making these trade-offs. There's never a best answer. There's usually never a worst answer. It's some muddled shade of gray. We kind of stumble through a bit, and we use risk analysis. I'm going to focus mostly on risk analysis during this webcast because I think that's the most important thing to nail down. Beyond this mindset uh, slide, this slide is the most important slide if you pass the exam, by the way. And I can thank um, Dave Miller for this slide. We didn't have this slide in the class. Dave Miller, a CISB author and a, a, one of our instructors, I would talk through this stuff, but I never had a slide. We just, you know, and he's like, we should have a slide. I'm like, you're exactly right. So thank you, Dave Miller, for laying this out. So when, when you're parsing these model questions and you're not sure what the best answer is, think in that order, okay? And remember, you're a conservative Harvard MBA style manager, right? You're not an engineer, you're a manager, right? Classic management question that engineers get wrong. Two Ethernet cards have the same uh, MAC address in hardware, um, you know, what's going on here, right? You have sort of a pseudo question. And one of the answers is MAC addresses are always unique in hardware, right? And engineers get that one. That's the right answer. Uh, the, the MAC address, which is the 48-bit address burned in, and, and I'm talking hardware address, not a virtual address for like cloud or something. I'm talking about the actual card. Those are designed to be globally unique across the planet. 
and on the exam they are. Now, have I in my 25 plus year engineering career seen two Macs, uh, two, two Ethernet cards with the same MAC address? I actually have, once. Once, and that was 20 plus years ago. I never saw it again. Obviously, someone screwed up at the factory. But if you're reaching back for 20 years of like deep, deep engineering knowledge, you are way overthinking the question. Back up, back up. Has your Harvard MBA uh, trained manager, if that's who you have, style, um, has, has he or she seen that? Probably not. Probably not, right? So don't overthink the questions. Keep your management hat on. Just uh, the eight domains, just an FYI, they, they reorganized them a few years ago from 10 to eight. The order doesn't make a lot of sense. It doesn't flow very well. It's not designed for good flow. And sometimes I get that, that comment in class and the, the comment's correct. You get these weird jumbled up domains like domain three, which has physical uh, security in it and it's got crypto in it. It's, it's kind of a grab bag. The way they organize them doesn't make a lot of sense. It doesn't matter from an exam perspective. All the, all the questions show up in kind of random order. There are apparently allegedly multiple exams in play. If you, I've been told if, if you fail the exam and retake it, you won't see a single repeat question, right? The way this comes up, by the way, uh, a friend of yours, a peer of yours takes the exam and they don't see, they see very little crypto, uh, cryptography questions. They tell you, oh, skip crypto. There's no crypto on the exam. This is terrible advice, terrible advice. They're not trying to be harmful, but they are because they saw a whatever eight or 10, you know, 10% slice of the questions in the pool. I don't know how many questions in the pool, but you might see 10% on one exam, meaning there's 90% you're not seeing. Thing. I'm, I, this is an inference on my part. I don't know. They don't release these numbers, right? So if anyone tells you, like, and, and there's also an NDA, which, which they're kind of fr infringing on there. They're, they're, they're towing the line there by saying that, but I won't get into that. But um, it's bad advice regardless, because you're very unlikely to see the same exam. They see. You're almost certainly not going to see that exam. Um, and, you know, if, if you start acing it, they can start throwing really hard crypto questions at you because you're acing it, right? And, and the engine's inferring you're a bit weak there. It'll kind of like, like a divining rod find that weakness in a way to get half the questions wrong while you're passing it, right? Strange exam. So um, for testable content beyond the mindset, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, th this should be tattooed in your brain. You, this should be second nature to you. Confidentiality, secrets remain secret. You lose confidentiality, you have disclosure. Integrity is data is not altered in an unauthorized fashion. Data or systems, by the way. We have data integrity and system integrity. And if you lose integrity, it means it's been altered in an unauthorized fashion, right? So what's the difference between data integrity and system integrity? You have a database server running Oracle. The system integrity is the software in the operating system. So if I, if I install a rootkit, a backdoor, I violated system integrity. If I change a bank account from you know a thousand to a million, that's a data integrity. So system integrity is your operating system and the applications, making sure they're passed and secure. That's that's system integrity. And malware often violates system integrity, right? By changing the operating system or changing the application in a malicious way or adding backdoors, things like that. And data integrity is the actual data, database in the table. So the Oracle software would be system integrity. The the data in the tables will be data integrity. And then availability means your systems are available for normal business use. They're up and they're running, right? And balancing this triad is this dynamic tension. The best security is no availability, right? If, if I unplug the server and bury it in concrete, right? Uh, confidentiality, integrity are easy to maintain at that point, but there's no availability. And you won't have a very long InfoSec career if you start unplugging stuff. So we have to you know, dynamically manage this tension and, and, and availability pulls against confidentiality and integrity. And if availability is not a concern, the other two get really easy, right? And we're constantly managing that. I remember when you know I worked for, as I said, I was a HIPAA security officer for the second largest healthcare provider in New England. And we went from like 50 remote access um, users via IPsec VPN using dual factor authentication, which is a good answer on the exam, to like 500 via Citrix. And so we went from 50 users to 500 users. And I said, well, healthcare data via the internet, we have to have dual factor authentication. And my boss overrode me and said, no. And to this day, I disagree with that uh, answer, by the way. And on the exam, I disagree with that answer too, but that's life in the big city. It's like one of the reasons I started my own company, I run my own company now for 12, 13 years. I got tired of people telling me, you know, overriding what was clearly the best thing to do. You know, give me money, give me the money, give me the budget. I'm good with uh, low budgets, small budgets, but once I have that, support me. And every job got to a point where someone made a decision I disagreed with. And I was, if, if the CIO says, no, no dual factor, it's too expensive. They go and use it in password only. And that's what happened, right? 
wrong exam on the uh, answer on the exam, by the way, <laughs> dual factor for sure. Um, but so, I mean, so availability is constantly tugging against you the two. We have to manage that, right? So confidentiality, you lose confidentiality, you have disclosure of PII. So the most common thing you'll see is PII as far as that term, uh, personally identifiable information. There's other things like HD cardholder data for PCI, which is payment card industry, uh, PHI, which is protected healthcare information and healthcare HIPAA, right? So we lose confidentiality, you have disclosure, you lose integrity of alteration, you lose availability, you have destruction. And now don't think of it, destruction isn't necessarily the server's on fire, though it could be. Think of destruction as destruction of access, you've lost access. The CIA triad may be called AIC or ICA, that's not, the order doesn't matter, it's the terms, but disclosure alteration and destruction is usually called DAD. That is the opposite of CIA, that's what happens when you lose CIA. And uh, so we've talked about the first three now, and then we have AAA systems, and I added a AAA logo there. <laughs> I'm a baseball fan, there's not much baseball going on. Uh, although Japan and uh, Korea has some baseball going on, if, if you're curious. And um, AAA systems, they're really IAAA, they're not called that. Uh, identification, authentication, authorization, and accountability or accounting, we'll talk about that. So it's called a AAA system, but really it's IAAA. The exam will call it AAA because you can't have the, the authentication, authorization, or accountability without identification. Like, who are you? Identification is who are you, right? Once I know who you are, I can authenticate you via a password or maybe dual factor authentication, better answer. Then I'm authorized to take certain actions, read certain files, write to certain files. Account accounting or accountability is proving what happened after the fact. You know, Eric Conrad logged in at 2 p.m., you know, read this file at 2.10, changed this file at 2.13, logged out at 2.17. That's accountability, right? So AAA, but really think of it as IAAA. And just to kind of um, hammer these concepts in, these should be second nature to you. They should be just tattooed in your brain, as I said. It doesn't have to be malicious, by the way. Beware of any question that implies malice is, is uh, required. Many, many breaches have happened due to mistakes, right? So uh, the exam won't call it this, but I call it layer eight. Layer eight is the unofficial OSI model, the person making the mistake. You know, layer seven is data or application data. Layer eight is the person making a mistake, right? And the exam won't use the term layer eight, but layer eight issues are severe. You know, the, the user clicking enabling macros on the phishing campaign, you know? You know, they, they get an email, this document is signed by DocuSign, an email my user got. Click here to uh, decrypt the email, you know, the, the, the sensitive data. And by clicking here, you're turning on macros, macros install the back door. So obviously the intent of the phishing campaign was malicious, but the user's not being malicious. The user's simply making a mistake. Users will make mistakes. You have to build your systems to account for that. You can do all the phishing uh, campaigns you want, all the awareness you want, it doesn't matter. Somebody's gonna click. Somebody's always gonna click, right? And why are you letting the user enable macros in the first place? Why do they have that ability? You know, why can any user arbitrarily choose whether they have macros running or not. That's a terrible, terrible risk choice. You could beat the user up for make falling for that mistake, but why let them make that mistake? Why not tightly control macros by only allowing macros for certain users, requiring signed macros, right? Macros, of course, as you know, are the things in uh, Microsoft Office documents most prominently that can run code, right? Including install backdoors, right? And why let the user make that decision? Why don't you make that decision as a policy, right? And by the way, it won't be on the exam, but the Australian Signals Directorate, the ASD, um, they have um, their mitigations. If you Google ASD mitigations, they have a lot of great advice on this. Just ASD mitigations, that won't be on the exam, but the things that those mitigations talk about will be on the exam. Dual factor authentication, macros, how to you know, manage macros, things like that. All right, integrity, we have, again, data integrity and system integrity, we talked about that and uh, unauthorized modification. But again, people can make mistakes as well. It's not always ma uh, malicious. Availability means your systems are available for normal business use. The canonical attack on availability is a denial of service attack, right? A DOS or a DDOS, distributed denial of service attack, right? And uh, if you see DOS, scan for an availability answer, right? If you see availability in the question, scan for a DOS answer, right? The, the, often you'll see that, right? Privacy protects your PII, that term I've already used, right? So privacy is gonna be paramount on the exam. You are very pro-privacy on the exam. You're also very pro-fairness on the exam. You wanna make sure your employees are handled um, fairly. Employee terminations are fair. You know, if you have an explicit content policy, which you should, an acceptable use policy, talking about explicit content, right? And you have a system that, uh, like a web content filtering solution that flags when users go to explicit websites, right? 
Um, let's say you, you have a, a system set up around that where the, the exam term will be clipping level, clipping level, just like, you know, clipping with scissors, clipping. A clipping level is like, do you want to be notified every time someone clicks on a link that the web content filter thinks is um, explicit? In my experience, no. Uh, users do accidentally stumble into these things, and I've done plenty of this kind of work at my last company. You know, uh, don't go there now, but whitehouse.com used to be a very different White House, and the president didn't live there. <laughs> don't go there, right? <laughs> I don't know what's there now, but don't go there. And so can a user accidentally stumble into onesie twosie? Yeah. So a clipping level will say, don't tell me every time someone hits the explicit content filter. Tell me when they hit it five times, 10 times, whatever your risk, your data, your decision, right? Your policy, have a policy. Once you have that policy, I don't care if it's the, uh, a vice president or the food service worker, they're treated equally. If it says, you know, five hits in five minutes and call HR, you do that for everyone. The food service worker and the VP is treated equally. Now, that may not be realistic in your world. I've seen cases where it wasn't in my world, uh, previous jobs, but on the exam, give the fair answer. Always give the fair answers. Any kind of investigation for acceptable use policy often leads to phishing campaigns where managers try to fire, you know, mediocre workers. They try to find a shortcut for a mediocre worker. You know, tell me how many times Phil here hit the explicit content filter. Seven. Okay, fire Phil. Is that a fair answer? Probably not. Yeah, who, who else hit that filter seven times or more? And were they sanctioned as well, the same as Phil was? Or was that just a phishing campaign to get rid of a mediocre employee, right? So it's fine if Phil gets fired if everyone who hits that, that filter uh, seven times gets fired. Everyone, right? So be, be very pro-fairness on the exam. Identification is making a claim. Um, my name's Eric Conrad. I identify myself. My, my name is Phil Smith. I also identified myself. Now, clearly, the second one's wrong. But identification is weak. There's no proof, right? There's no proof. Authentication is proving that identity claim through a password or I have better yet dual factor authentication, something like that, right? Authorization, as I said, the actions you're allowed to take in that system once you've identified and authenticated, right? And accounting or accountability, uh, as you said there, is proving what happened after the fact, audit trails, things like that. And something you know, which is weak, we all know, passwords have basically failed, in my opinion, and many others, right? Um, something you have, token smart card, something you are, biometrics, some place you are. On the exam, they ask you some place you are. It's often a military style thing where, you know, write launch code and write GPS location before the bomb launches. That'd be dual factor, by the way. Two or more of those, well, two of those is called uh, two factor or multi factor or well, dual factor if it's two, right? And dual factor is going to be better than single factor in every case. Principle of least privilege, most people have too much access, right? They they can do a lot of damage or the malware running, running on their behalf can do the same damage they can do, right? So whether through mistakes or do we have malicious users? Sure, we do. They're not as common. Mistakes are more common. Remember Hanlon's razor, never attribute to malice that which is adequately explained by stupidity, right? That's called Hanlon's razor. Hanlon's razor won't be on the exam that term, I don't think, I don't know. Um, but that's a good thing to remember in your career and on the exam. It's the, the world's more dumb than evil. Right. People are more people tend to make more honest mistakes than do intentionally malicious things. So it's usually assume good, you know, and it's usually mistakes before evil. Though I've seen evil. I've, I've handled terrible cases. I've handled cases that involving child pornography that was haunting, literally haunting me. Right. And um, so I've seen evil things, but I've seen a lot more dumb mistakes. Right. You have to. And so if someone does make that dumb mistake or the, the malware takes over their account or they are evil, um, the less access they have, the better off, obviously, you are. Separation of duties, this happens when, uh, you know, a, a transaction or be, uh, an action is so critical that you need to, um, uh, one person alone can't, can't finish it themselves, right? So a good example would be a bank teller. A bank, many banks have a maximum um, dollar transaction per day per teller and also maximum dollar transaction per transaction without a manager approval. So you, you can, you know, I would draw $300, one teller. I would draw $30,000, teller plus manager, right? To help prevent fraud, right? So separation of duties, and the canonical example is in the movies, and they're gonna launch the nuke, and, and then the, the two members of the military sit down, they both turn their key. That's a classic separation of duties play, right? What happens when the manager and the bank teller become, uh, um, they, they collude. Collusion is aggregating your access to overcome separation of duties, right? That's called collusion. So Bob and Susan, if your name's Bob or Susan, sorry, but you probably know the crypto people, Bob and Susan, and they're trying to communicate and Eve, the eavesdropper is sniffing. So Bob and Susan, Susan's the manager, Bob's a teller, 
they, they start dating, they're malicious, and they decide to aggregate their access, right? To um, withdraw a million dollars and fly off the Caribbean. Either one alone couldn't do it, but together they can, right? That's called collusion. Rotation of duties is Alice needs to take a two-week vacation, uh, let's say, and someone else rotates in. That's also called mandatory vacation in that case, right? And the mandatory vacation is, yeah, you need to use your vacation for, you know, health, you know, lifestyle purposes. But really, the real reason in a bank is we want to make sure you're not going to commit fraud. And if a new manager comes in for two weeks and their goal is to run the branch, but their goal is also to spot any uh, signs of malfeasance, you're much less likely to commit that fraud if you know you're going to have to leave for two weeks, right? We'll talk about deterrent versus um, detective controls in a bit. Just worth noting, you may be noticing, I'm, I'm calling out terminology pretty carefully, like clipping level and collusion, because terminology is important. If you see a valid term in a sea of words, uh, use that valid term to anchor you. And it turns out due care and due diligence are testably different, which I didn't know. Uh, due care is just being reasonable. Prudent man rule. Like, th there's no law probably telling you, you must, if you have children as I do, saying uh, you have to have brush your teeth and feed them and keep them as safe as you can. There's no like, you know, rule book or policy on that. You just have to be a reasonable parent. You have to use due care. If you, if you don't use due care, the state can take your kids away because you're grossly negligent, right? So if you don't demonstrate due care, you can't be found negligent or grossly negligent. Due care is informal. Due diligence is a process. I expect all my engineers to patch their systems because they're engineers, come on. I expect my engineers to follow due care, due diligence. I audit to see if they've patched. So due, due, due diligence is like auditing due care. And it's a higher calling legally. It's a higher calling. It's a process. Due care is informal. Due diligence is a process. So I mentioned we have types of controls here, preventive, detective, corrective, deterrent, recovery, and compensating. Um, one of the main things in these controls is don't memorize them. You know, a firewall is preventive technical, right? A lock is preventive physical. But I wouldn't, those are pretty safe examples. But some controls like a, a human security guard, an actual guard, um, what are they? Well, they could be detective, meaning they, they, they see you, right, breaking in. They could be a deterrent, meaning you see two buildings, the criminal sees two buildings, one has guards, one doesn't, and they rob the second building. What control were the guards in the first building? They deterred. So a guard could detect you by seeing you. A guard could deter you by simply being there, and you decide to rob someplace else, the criminal does, not you, of course. So don't memorize firewall preventive technical, lock preventive technical. I call it the bucket game. That's a losing game. Now, firewall and lock are very safe that way. Um, on the exam anyways, but what's a guard? So instead of memorizing control combinations, just understand what preventive means. Preventive means you stop the attack from happening. Detective means you detect the attack as it's happening, let's say. Corrective and uh, recovery, I'll go through those now. You surf the internet, you get some pop-ups, you know, your browser's hijacked, IT fixes it for you, they run a, a fix-up program. That's a corrective control, the fix-up program, anti-spyware. You serve the internet, you get you know a botnet installed, and IT reinstalls your operating system. They recover your operating system by re-imaging the whole system. That's recovery. Now, you know, same story, user goes online, bad things happen. But corrective is you fix the problem in place, the OS stays in place. Recovery is you you re-image the whole system. So recovery means higher impact. Deterrent, be aware of dog sign, use of deadly forces authorized sign, right? That's a deterrent control. Um, compensating control is a control to make up for a weakness in another control. You have a legacy system. Hospitals are full of legacy systems. Hospitals still have Windows NT. Hospitals certainly still have Windows XP and Windows 7, which is now legacy as well because it's not being patched. So you have that CAT scan machine running on Windows NT, yes, real example, in 2020, yes. Uh, you can't patch it. What do you do? You don't leave it there. You install perhaps a hardware firewall dedicated for that device. Now, the best answer, obviously, is to replace it. But believe me, I've had those arguments in the hospital. And if it's performing its medical function, that's a hard argument to win when you work for a nonprofit healthcare chain as I did. So I, I couldn't replace these things. And in, in many cases, I couldn't. I couldn't leave them there as is, which many sites do. So I improved, I did a compensating control, a, a one-off firewall dedicated to that device. Still better to replace, obviously, but compensating helps a lot with legacy controls. Or perhaps you can't replace it today, but maybe in six months. So compensating control buys you some time. Administrative, think paper, policies, procedures, tactical, like hardware, things like that, firewalls, you know, servers, physical locks, dogs, fences, et cetera. So I'm gonna focus mostly on risk for the next 20 odd minutes now. Um, and um, you've probably been noticing during this pandemic I have, people are terrible at risk analysis. They really, it's a day to day, just walking around. They are awful, awful at risk analysis. <laughs> so. 
<laughs> so let's talk risk analysis, right? And um, risk is threat times vulnerability. I'll give you an example on that shortly, often using simple numbers. And you have to determine how much risk you have and then make intelligent decisions based on that, right? So risk can be counterintuitive. This is an example from um, a seismologist, a, a geographer, right? Um, what is the higher risk? I had this conversation because our data center and our backup data center were both in the city of Boston, right? About nine miles apart. So the DR site was nine miles from the main site, you know, too close, right? So I had a conversation on risk of earthquakes to my California born CIO who said Boston doesn't get earthquakes. I said, yeah, well, you're wrong. <laughs> I grew up in the city, we get them, but not as common, but there was one in colonial times that if it happened today it would flatten the city. Boston had no seismic codes until 1975. Yes, I, I've, I've done the research on this because I had data centers in Boston, right? So what's a higher risk? Damage to a building in San Francisco versus Boston, it's a trap, it's a trap. That shows you how almost everyone, including me, would have said, of course, San Francisco, because you're focusing on the threat, which is the earthquake, but you're not focusing on the vulnerability, which is how strong is that building uh, in regards to earthquakes. Right. It turns out San Francisco has had great seismic codes for years and years. Any data center is very likely to be in a building built through stringent uh, seismic codes. Boston, the vast majority of Boston was built out before 1975. Every one of my data centers was in a building built way before 1975. No seismic code whatsoever. So a minor earthquake that would be a shrug in San Francisco could be very devastating in Boston. So most people focus on the threat. You need to look at the vulnerability, multiply them together. Remember, anything times zero is zero. Keep that in mind. Um, but uh, these counterintuitive risk questions can really trip you up. So make sure you run the numbers when you can. And quantitative allows you to run those numbers. Quantitative, think quantity, okay? Quantity as opposed to qualitative, which is gonna be banded values, low, medium, high, things like that. And um, I have the numbers here or, or the terms here. I'm gonna give you an actual concrete example on the next slide. So I won't spend too much time on this slide. I'm gonna dig down to an actual example of should you buy this control? Should you buy the web application firewall to prevent DOS attacks? Is that a wise decision? And that, that's a very fair exam question. It's a very fair real world question. So here are the terms here. You have that for future reference, but here's a scenario. I'm gonna walk through that on the next slide here, okay? So you're an information security manager. You make a million dollars profit a year. Uh, each DOS attack costs you 2%. And they're gonna, you, you should start calculating numbers in your mind right now. You will have a whiteboard and a dry erase marker you can run the numbers on. Usually the numbers in this case would be simple enough to do in your head. I did, but you know, you have the whiteboard if you need it there. And uh, you have a WAF service that costs 40 grand a year, plus $10,000 in OPEX, operational dollars to run for staff. Now, uh, is it a wise purchase? Okay, so don't use your gut because they're giving you hard numbers. And when they give you hard numbers like this, expect to run them. So the, this is, we're trying to get to the annualized loss expectancy which is about halfway down that slide. How much money do we lose a year? When the quantitative risk analysis is typically an annual discussion. I kept it simple by having it be a service. If they had you buy the firewall as a, a WAF, as a piece of hardware, they'd probably mention the amortization schedule, like five-year amortization schedule. I, I kept this example simpler. But if it costs a million dollars and you have a five-year amortization schedule, that's 200 grand a year, all right? And then, then it's end of life. So you may have to do that little dance as well. Not too hard though. So you're making a million dollars a year. Your exposure factor is 2%. So it means one DOS is uh, 20 grand, right? You have six DOSs a year on average. You might have five, you might have 10, but you know, average. And by the way, you're conservative here. If you really think it's 5.1 based on bringing the numbers, you may call it six because you're conservative. Would you rather be $20,000 overinsured for your fire insurance on your house or 20,000 under? Well, I prefer to be hit the, na uh, the nail on the head, but if I have to be a little a little high or a little low, I guess I'd be a little high, okay? So be conservative that way. So six a year, 120 grand, we lose 120 grand a year. All right, now I have a number I can work with. Now, this is a simpler example. No mention of loss of data. Money alone, much simpler. PII is gonna change this. But as a pure cash transaction, this gets real simple, right? All right, well, the WAF costs 40 grand plus 10, 40 grand for the service, 10 grand to run it, 50 grand. My return on investment is the annualized loss expectancy minus the total cost of ownership. Total cost of ownership, remember, is not just what it costs to buy that thing, it's staff to run it, right? A lot of people ignore that part. Every new shiny box you buy, every appliance has a cost, right, in time. And I see sites who can barely manage what they have buying more, stop. They can barely run what they have. 
and people keep throwing more shiny boxes in the mix, you know, more appliances, right? And they can't even run what they have. So always keep in mind the operational dollars required to run that thing, right? So it turns out it's 50 grand a year of TCO. We're losing 120 grand a year. We're gonna save 70 grand by buying this thing. That's a strong win right there. Any manager, any manager would be like, yes, yes, let's do that, right? Qualitative is banded values, low, medium, high, right? And this is, quantitative is less subjective. It's more hard numbers. Qualitative is subjective. I'll give an example I had from uh, a Cisco partner called me once I do business with, and I helped them consult, used to anyways. And uh, one of their clients was worried. They had multiple laptops stolen with PII unencrypted on them, requiring um, state breach notification. They had multiple worms that also stole PII, requiring more breach notification. And the, the, the firm's trying to fix all that. And the, the manager wants to talk about how his NTP is unencrypted. That was what he wanted to talk about. Like unencrypted NTP. Now NTP is, is the uh, network time protocol, uses UDP port 123, it isn't unencrypted. Could you have a malicious time server send you bad time? Yeah, you could. Is that common? I've never seen that in my entire career. Coming on 30 years, never once, right? And and he was like, he was treating all risk as equal. All risk is not equal. Risk is not binary. So let's plot out the stolen laptops. Uh, well, we had three cases last year and we haven't done anything to fix that. So that's gonna be a high likelihood. The impact is we're notifying the feds or the state. That's bad. On the exam, that's that's capital B bad. So it's, it's high likelihood, high impact, that's a five. Worms, same calculation, high impact, that's a five. Unencrypted network time, because you read some article and got a, you know, a hair up as you know what. Uh, I've never seen that in my entire career. Low, right? That's a bit of a, a subjective statement, but this is subjective, right? More subjective. What's the impact? I guess eventually Active Directory, uh, Kerberos has tickets, there's timestamps. You could break authentication, a reboot would fix it. I'm calling impact low as well. I mean, compared to relatively to the impact of the laptops, low or medium, here's what you do. You plot out all the reds and all the oranges and all the yellows and all the beiges and all the greens, and you work from five down to one. And when you're done with all the highs, meaning the laptops and the worms, you go down to the fours, you go down to the threes, you go down to the twos, and finally at the one, no one gets to the one, by the way. In the meantime, you document it. So I said, draw that out on a whiteboard, tell them you get undocumented, and say, we'll get to this one when we're done with the fives, the fours, the threes, the twos. He said, great. And he stopped talking about unencrypted time. <laughs> Let the angels sing. And by the way, the reason I couldn't do it, he had this crazy, I'm like, well, just turn it on. It's easy. Internal. He's talking internal NTP. I'm like, turn it on. It's, it's a piece of cake to turn on. He's like, Eric, he's got Soho gear. He's got neck gear. He's got Linksys. He's got this whole mix of stuff he bought off Amazon that can't do any of that. And we're trying to upgrade his core. Yes, that's not going to happen tomorrow. I'm like, okay, got it. So a little summary now of quantitative and qualitative. I think beyond the mindset of the exam, the most important thing in, well, understanding the cornerstone concepts like CIA, having a good grasp on risk analysis is critical for passing that exam. Risk is boiled into almost all the questions. So keep that in mind. That's why I'm focusing on risk in our 45 minutes, 50 minutes together. Excessive miss risk means you, um, you walk away, right? And you walk away from the risk. Often when, going back now, you have a new project, right? I'm backing up a bit. You have a new project that's gonna make you, I say $100,000 a year, but the ALE is gonna be $200,000 a year. Let's put all our medical records online, Eric. How about no, Scott? You know? <laughs> so usually excessive risk is a potential new project and you walk away. Like, you know what? We're gonna make a hundred grand, but we're gonna, you know, uh, but the TCO is 200, we're gonna lose. No, 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 right? And uh, so we need to lower risk. Um, how can we lower that risk, right? So risk avoidance, as I said, usually happens when the ALE results in a negative ROI, and it's, you don't have to do it. It's a money-making venture only. It's gonna prove to lose money, so you simply walk away. So this is most common what most commonly happens on new projects. Potential new projects, and you run the numbers, and I've had this conversation when a doctor wanted to put 100,000 records online. Oh, no, 10,000, 10,000 records online. I'm like, okay, well, well, ballpark estimate, we lose one record, that's $100. That's a good ballpark estimate for, for medical data, by the way. The cost of losing a record, Ponymon does, does these studies. All right, 100,000 records times, uh, 10,000 records times $100 a record, we're talking a lot of money if we had a breach. How much are we gonna make on this? And it was like a nice to have, not a gotta have. And we, we ran the numbers on this thing, and within about 20 minutes, they abandoned the product. They're like, you know what? This doesn't make any sense whatsoever. We walked away from a potential new project, right? That's usually where these things come up. Transferring the risk, you buy insurance. That used to be, uh, beware of easy buttons. There's no easy button in, in this world. 
you know, we'll have mediocre security, but we'll buy insurance. Yeah, that's not working anymore. <laughs> insurance company has caught wise to this now. So if you buy breach uh, insurance and you have a breach, most insurance companies will audit you to make sure you're demonstrating due care and due diligence, right? And so if you don't have these controls in place, you're using breach insurance as like a get out of jail free card. That might've worked five, 10 years ago. That is not working today. They're gonna audit you. If you can't prove due diligence, due care, they're not gonna pay, or they're gonna pay less. I've seen that happen, right? So it's a perfectly valid answer on the exam. Uh, you transfer the risk of fire. You don't take on the risk of fire to your home if you own a home. You pay someone. You transfer that risk. If your home burns down, they give you money, right? And all insurance companies do is they monetize risk. You know, if I look at 10,000 houses and the average risk of fire is $300 a house per year and I charge everyone $400 a house per year, that's free money. That's free money. I make $100 per house, right? As long as I get the risk analysis correct, it's free money, right? So insurance companies simply sell risk. They buy and sell risk. So transferring the risk is a great exam answer, if you can. Now, uh, for risk, you never, never accept the risk of loss or, or, or injury. Never, never, never. You must always mitigate any danger. Physical danger must always be mitigated, meaning reduced or ideally eliminated, right? We'll talk about that. You can't accept the risk, or it's more common to lower than accept. Now, accepting the risk has to be a rational decision. It can't be just a rash decision. It has to be rational. You have to think it through. But in the case of a Windows NT machine, as a CAT scan machine, we installed a uh, hardware-based firewall. It was in a secure area uh, with strong physical security. We lowered the risk. Is there still risk there? You bet there is. But it's a lower risk just being one system of 20,000 on a three-state WAN, which it was before we lowered the risk. So again, when you look at the controls, don't just focus on the CapEx, that's the capital dollars, the upfront cost. Look at the operational dollars, what it costs to run that thing, the staff, the maintenance, the subscriptions, things like that, right? And uh, calculate the return on investment and the total cost of ownership. Preventive controls are pretty easy to do this on, but detective controls can be a bit trickier because detective controls are very expensive. A, a intrusion detection system that simply alerts and doesn't stop like an IPS would, intrusion prevention system, it can be harder to uh, generate those numbers, um, but preventive controls, which is usually how the exam will ask you for these things, can be very straightforward. Just be very careful, merger acquisition. My company went through this after I left. They acquired two more hospitals. And uh, before I left, I said, listen, before you join those two networks, we need to perform threat hunting, right? Send my team over there to look for intrusions that the company we're acquiring has, um, you know, didn't prevent or detect. All networks come pre-owned, by the way, that's your mindset. That's called uh, um, threat hunting, it's finding that. Finding the, the, the intrusions, your prevention and detection have failed to prevent. Marriott acquired Sheraton. Sheraton was pre-owned. They merged those networks in some form and a massive, massive GDPR fine followed in Europe. Massive, right? Millions and millions of euros. Um, so when you, when you merge, uh, acquire a company, you have to perform your due diligence on that network. My company, after I left, didn't, by the way. <laughs> I won't go into what happened, but it wasn't good. Um, <laughs> it was not as bad as the Sheridan Marriott thing, but it was, I'm just glad I wasn't there when it happened. All right, so um, always do your due diligence before you merge or acquire. And obviously when you demerge, you divest of a company, um, make sure, that's, I think it's tricky as well. One company becomes two, do, does one employee of, you know, company A becomes company B and C. Can a company B employee log in a company C or vice versa? Where's that data go? That can get very, very sticky to make sure all that access is properly chased down. Just a little summary now. I, the last few slides here, beyond risk analysis, I just try to find the most dense information slides I could and throw them at you in the time, the seven or so minutes I have left with you. Um, policy is telling you what to do high level, right? There's no Linux or Windows in a policy. Stand, well, a procedure is, uh, I'll go a bit out of order here. Procedure is a low level. Procedures do talk, um, like a policy statement, this policy protects the CIA of our PII, right? That's a policy statement. Procedure, step one to install a server, step one, step two, step three, step four to install a Windows server. Procedures are also mandatory. Standards are also mandatory. Here's our standard laptop build. For an average user, you can have a power user, you can have a developer laptop, you can have a VIP laptop, but once you do, you know, our, our average user laptop is, is a Lenovo ThinkPad, whatever, and that's what everyone gets. Power users get this. Um, standards lower the total cost of ownership of maintaining a control. If you have a thousand laptops, a thousand makes and models, a thousand different BIOSes, a thousand different backups or not, or full disencryption or not, that's that's an unmaintainable mess. If 
the building falls down, right? Good luck recovering. If you have a thousand standard laptops, standard laptop build, standard full disk encryption, et cetera, you're much more likely to survive. Baseline is discretionary. Discretionary does not mean optional, by the way. And Horde Tipton, who used to, he, he's passed away now. He was a very senior person at IC Squared. He wrote a blog post on how discretionary does not mean optional. So you have a baseline and saying, okay, you're gonna hire it with the CIS guidelines. And when you, when your senior um, engineer says, you know what, that's fine for the junior staff. I have my own standard baseline, excuse me, that's better, I'll use mine. And so I'm, I'm gonna follow my my baseline, not, not there, because mine's actually better. It's harder to pull off, but it's better. And you, you say, okay, document that decision, I agree, go ahead and do it. But that's not just like, that's not optional. It's not, it's not like, yeah, I'm not gonna do it. That's, you know, I use my professional discretion to, to do something different, I document that, that's discretionary. And uh, a guideline is simply a suggestion. Here's how you make a good password. Any one of us can make a good password without following that advice. But maybe someone like my mother, I can't wait to see my kids this summer in 2020. I can make that a I, C, W, et cetera, grandkids rather, okay. Just a little summary on crypto and uh, confidentiality, integrity, authentication. We've covered all those. Non-repudiation is the one we haven't covered. Non-repudiation is the marriage of integrity and authentication. Like digital signature provides non-repudiation. I know you signed the document. I know it hasn't changed. That's non-repudiation. You can't repudiate or deny having done something, okay? And so we've talked about those three. Non-repudiation is a good one to know. Digital signatures provide non-repudiation. And speaking of digital signature, I'm going to give you a really crash course now on asymmetric encryption. encryption. Buckle up. <laughs> asymmetric and hashing. By the way, hashing is encryption. I don't care. I, I've seen more misinformation. Hashing is encryption. I've got two-star Amazon reviews telling me I don't know what, what hashing is. I don't know what encryption is because hashing, literally uh, this guy flamed me with a two-star Amazon review because he thought hashing wasn't encryption. He passed the exam by reading my book, by the way. Um, but, you know, he's wrong. <laughs> hashing is encryption using an algorithm and no key, right? It provides integrity, not um, confidentiality. That's what hashing does. And by the way, encryption is not always about uh, confidentiality. That's one of the four things it can do. A digital signature provides no confidentiality. The, the plain text is plain text, unless you separately provide confidentiality by encrypting it, right? So we have a hash algorithm, we generate that hash. This is the sender and your email client would do this for you. And then you encrypt with a private key. Asymmetric encryption is two key encryption. The revolution of the 1970s led by RSA and Diffie Hellman and um, if I encrypt with private, I can decrypt with public and vice versa. That's the magic of asymmetric encryption. So I generate a hash and I sign it with my private key. Encrypt with my private key. When you receive the email, you generate, generate the hash locally, right? That's the hash that exists on your system. You then decrypt my hash using my public key. If those two hashes match, I know that uh, in this case, Cosmo sent it and it hasn't changed. Why the hashes are the same, right? And uh, Cosmos, a public key decrypted, meaning only his private key could have encrypted it. I know, he, I know he sent it, I know it hasn't changed. That's the magic of a digital signature. And notice the email is plain text. And uh, uh, the other, if you understood this, and that was, I went through that 10 times faster than I would in class, by the way. <laughs> so just FYI, I don't teach this fast in class, but I'm trying to pack in testable information here. But if you at some point, maybe not now, because I was fast, understand this slide, this slide and what these do, you're in very, very good shape with this entire section of, of a domain, right? So in this case, we're also using asymmetric encryption. And one of the key things here is this, is this two parts here. There's asymmetric and symmetric. Hashing's in here too, but I won't um, belabor that point. So I talk to the server, I say, hey, I want to encrypt, right? And the server sends me its public key in this case, right? It sends me an X509 certificate, but inside there is a bunch of stuff, including the public key. I generate a, a random number to keep it simple, and I encrypt it with the server's public key, and I send it back. Um, and so we, we uh, and the server then decrypts with the private key. So I generate a random number, I encrypt it with the server's public key, I send it back. The server decrypts with private, right? The private key is on the server. We now both have the same random number. We use that to generate a symmetric session key, right? Symmetric. Symmetric, symmetric encryption is the encryption you're probably most used to you encrypt, decrypt with the same password. Asymmetric, you have a public private key. Symmetric, one key, right? Why would I use both asymmetric and symmetric? Because symmetric is faster and stronger than asymmetric. Don't think asymmetric is better because it's newer. It simply solves the problem of sharing a key with a stranger. That, that's the magic behind it, right? So I use the asymmetric part to exchange a symmetric key or agree on a symmetric key, right? I'm simplifying a bit here, but it's fine with the exam. So I encrypted your public key. 
you decrypt that, that random number with private. We both have the same um, a random number. Use that to generate a, a symmetric session key, and off we go. We use symmetric encryption for the rest of the tra uh, transaction. So using asymmetric, which is slower, just for the key exchange, and symmetric for the rest for the bulk encryption, that's the magic. Now, that also was lightning fast, over 10 times faster than normal teaching speed. But if you can, at some point, understand these four slides, you're in really, really good shape on all this stuff, right? The point I want to make here is um, security at every step of the life cycle, right? I'm, I'm jumping around through various domains to give you the most testability I can, right? But security through every step of the life cycle from the first meeting to the thing being thrown away. Security, 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 get in the room early. And when I was HIPAA security officer, I worked very, very hard to get in the room. You know, be in the room where it happens. You probably heard that song from Hamilton, right? I've seen Hamilton. I saw it in London, actually. <laughs> and uh, you know, Aaron Burr wanted to be in the room where it happens, right? Get in the room where it happens. Hey, let's put, let's put some medical records online. It's really helpful if a security person is in that room. Right. And I got really good at using my human network to get in that room and little birdies would tell me things and get in the room early. So security, security, security from the first project meeting to the thing being decommissioned, security every step of the way. And finally, I just want to call out um, a lot of people don't understand how SSDs and USBs work. And I was thrilled to see that the exam has added remnants properties of SSDs is now testable. Hallelujah. Uh, SSDs work very, very differently than magnetic media. Degaussing doesn't work. Degaussing is when you bathe in a magnetic field. That doesn't work. It's not magnetic, right? So degaussing a USB does nothing. If you want to destroy or secure the erase an SSD, uh, a bit level overwrite also will not get all data reliably. And a lot of people don't know this. If you overwrite sector zero to sector one million on, a, on an SSD, you will generally miss data why sector zero, sector one, sector two are not physical sectors anymore. They're logical sectors. When you overwrite a file, what happens is the old copy is marked unallocated and a new copy is created. Then later on in the background, there's this thing called garbage collection that collects that. Also, SSDs optimize. Have you ever been around a while? Maybe you defragged a drive. Right? You probably did that at some point in your lifetime if you've been around a while like I have. That's not automatic in the background. So sectors are flowing around and garbage collection is running, but if you overwrite every sector and you read the sectors, there's still data there because they're being jumbled. Garbage collection moves them around and well, the optimization moves them around. So overwriting all sectors will reliably miss data, right? I know it's going to be one, one, one tenth of 1%, but still. So for SSD, you either destroy, always a great option. The problem with destruction is you lose the device. It costs more money to do that. Military uh, secrets, you know, top secret destruction, by the way, burn barrels. Um, if the drive is physically intact, not damaged, ATA secure arrays will destroy all data. It just changes the, the encryption key to a different key, which destroys the data, right? So uh, new for the exam, which I'm thrilled to see the exam uh, having this very timely content. And also a lot of people don't know this stuff, so I wanted to call it out. All right, 45 slides in 53 minutes. <laughs> All right, hopefully you learned something. Uh, again, I don't normally teach that fast. If you're thinking, I, I can't deal with this guy for 51 hours. I don't talk this fast normally. I just want to pack it as much content as I could. Remember, you can email me at econradgmail.com. I'm looking at the question window now. Type your questions now. Shoot me an email if you have a question. And thank you so much for spending uh, your, your time with me. We had over 700 people. Wow, welcome. And if you do have extra time, as some of us do right now during this uh, crazy situation, one of the best things you can do is invest in yourself. You know, not everyone has extra time. I don't know what your, your, your life is like with children or whatever. I know some people don't have that luxury, but some people do have a little more time in their hands. I do. I've been working on courseware. But one thing you can do if you have some extra time is invest in yourself. And you always want to invest in an appreciating asset, and that's you. That's yourself. Investing in my career through certification is one of the smartest things I ever did. Investing in the knowledge uh, over time has certainly paid dividends for me. And pound for pound uh, of the certs I'm most proud of, the GX security expert is my most proud achievement. But for the cert that puts the most money in the bank, it's honestly this one. Um, time and time again, this is the one that matters, you know. And sometimes people get this cert because without those five letters, HR filters them out. I initially got my CISSP to avoid HR filtering. I did. But I found it to be much more valuable than, than just that. So again, if you have some downtime, not all of us do. But if you do, Use it to invest in yourself. And I'll hang around for questions. Otherwise, again, feel free to email me questions as well. Thank you so much for spending this time with me.
All right. I don't see any questions, Carol, so I'll hand it back to you. Eric, um, there are quite a few yep. questions. If you unlock the oh. questions window, uh, you'll see a bunch. Oh. I, I did have... Maybe can you read them? I don't, I don't see sure. them. Uh, what is the best course to prepare to pass this exam? I already <laughs> have it once. Please advise. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, I, I'm crazy biased because <laughs> I, I am co-author of SANS Management 414. So I don't, I, it's hard for me to answer that without sounding like a really biased person. So I don't know. <laughs> SANS, right, course, well, we can... love courses. <laughs> <laughs> All right, like we'll go on to the next biased. one. Someone says, uh, I attended October 19 Amsterdam Management 414. How long am I good to go for the exam, the exam content wise? As in, when oh, the exam content change and the training material I have becomes redundant? Nope. Um, you're good probably for another year. Well, you're, you're good probably until April 2021. We don't know. The the exam updates on a three-year schedule typically, and um, they announced the changes six months out. They have not done that yet. So you have at least six months, and you probably have till at least April 2021. All right. Thanks. Hi, Eric. For the crypto questions, do we need to know the bits and bytes technical as it is quite confusing and difficult to remember it unless you work with it regularly? That's all true. And yes, I focused. I didn't have time, obviously, to cover all of that. But on the big ones like AES and DES, yes, block size, bit size, testable. I would focus on AES and DES. And for the asymmetric methods, um, they have varying key lengths, but I would focus on RSA, certainly discrete algorithm, discrete logarithm, and elliptic curve. I'd focus on those for the bits and bytes. Those are very important. All right, thanks. Uh, someone says, how you need to get 700 to 1,000 points in order to pass, or 700 out of 1,000 points in order to pass. How many points are attributed to a question? It varies. Great question. It varies. Harder questions worth more, easier questions worth less, and you don't know. You don't know. I mean, the average would be about four or five points per question, but scenario questions, which are multiple questions on the same topic, are, are weighted more heavily. But um, yeah, you don't know. It's, it's basically, uh, you're going to see up between 100 and 150 questions. And by the way, those 700 points are also scaled. Uh, some questions scale higher, some questions scale lower. At the end of the day, you need to, you know, pass. And what, what's the pass rate? Somewhere around, we don't know, two thirds, 70% pass. So you need to, you need to do better than uh, you know, you need to do comparatively better than other students, let's say. <laughs> but it's a great question, but there's no good answer because the numbers change based on the, uh, the weighting and the scaling. All right, thanks. You have mentioned about crypt cryptography. So are we going to see questions about technical issues or let us say should, or, or let us say should managers know the technicalities beyond these technical terms? Yes, you should know uh, some of the bits and bytes. The, the exam generally, one of the things that's said about the exam, it's a mile wide and two inches deep, technically. That's generally true, but crypto is an exception. And also, by the way, network communications like TCP IP, like, you know, um, headers and stuff. Yeah, that, that's testable too. So there are exceptions. For crypto, there are some bits and bytes, as I said, technical stuff. The most important thing is to understand how it all fits together. And that's what I try to focus on on the four slides I gave for crypto. How do things connect together? When, when's a proper to use uh, digital signature? When should you use symmetric encryption? When should you use asymmetric encryption? Those are the most testable things, but you could see what's the block size of AES, right? You could see that question. All right, thanks. Uh, someone asks, how much is the average passing rate for the CISSP exam? We've heard two thirds pass. We don't know. IOC Squid has not released those numbers but I've heard somewhere around two thirds, 70% pass. Uh, but again, they don't release those numbers. If you do, I, I think one of the reasons SANS is so successful here, I know I'm biased. If you're more prepared than your average student, if you do better than the average student, you're very likely to pass. That's how I look at it. So if you're more prepared than the average student, you're very likely to pass. When I studied, I actually overstudied and I studied too much. I was told passing the exam was as hard as getting a PhD. It is not. It is very much not that hard or masters. It's not that hard at all. But someone told me that they gave me bad advice and I overstudied and I found it to be very straightforward. Now, I don't mean to under underplay the exam difficulty. I was just prepared. So if you're more prepared than average, you're very likely to pass is how I look at it. 
All right. Well, Eric, you've uh, gotten a lot of compliments on this webcast, a lot of thank yous. So that's wonderful. Uh, those of you who still have questions, uh, Eric's got his contact information there, so you can reach out to him directly. Uh, with that, we're out of time. Thank you so much, Eric, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast. Thank you.